Hello everyone, this is Ground Control speaking, and today we have an amazing human being with us. One of my favorite conversations today. His name is Cyril Mani. He is currently the Chief Marketing Officer and Engineering Design Lead at his startup called Vital, working on building self-flying long-distance drones that would transport emergency supplies to people in need. And by the way, Cyril is still completing his Bachelor's of Mechanical Engineering at McGill University as a Schulich Scholar which is the second largest scholarship for an undergrad in all of Canada. And at McGill, he is building rockets as the propulsion project lead at the McGill rocket team. And they were responsible for the construction of the first outdoor rocket engine test site in Montreal. Speaking of Montreal, he is also the scientific president of Expo Science or science fairs in the entire region. And before we start, I am obliged to inform you that you can follow us on Instagram at The Visionaires and on YouTube. You can email us at thevisionairespodcast at gmail.com if you have any questions, if you want to come on the show, or you simply want to chat. All right, give it up for Cyril Mani. You are in the room full of posters of rockets, but not not pictures, but like plants, designs, and, and like blueprints yes. and, and like explanations. And then you have a... tell Just for viewers who can't see what I'm seeing, but you have a telescope in the corner <laughs> and... No, I just want to be honest with you. I, I love people who are so dedicated to, to like a very specific thing, who have been uh, a kind of an obsession with their craft, <laughs> their passion, their vision of the world. It's really inspiring. No, it doesn't even have to be like space Thank exploration. You. If somebody was making like pottery in their basement and then, but this guy is just so obsessed, so dedicated, making the best pottery, you know, that's something so admirable in all of that. Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm obsessed with a couple of things and I feel like rocketry is the one that combines the best all these things. Um, like obviously science is, is something that has interested me forever and engineering is just the application of this science. Yeah. And then you have, you have space, which is like the final frontier, right? It's like the mm. main challenge of our generation and, and I love challenges. And so combining engineering, so the apply, applying right. science to the last frontier is, is super it's a passion for me and actually i don't for the people that can't see even my floor is covered uh, but no. here with uh, tubes of um engines so these are all Jesus. previous engines and also some of the tubes we'll use for our um our own hybrid engine that we're designing at the miguel rocket team so i'm in charge of of some components of the engine and to have my blueprints on the wall to make sure yeah. that i follow the right designs yeah no, I'm being the eyes of the the listener. Your floor is covered. <laughs> There's no floor space in your in your room. It's it's yeah. <laughs> you can engines. see the, the injector. You have the nozzles too that we've tested in the past and that we're improving. Yeah, that's the case of the material, and that's all our motor casings. And yeah, I mean, I'm surrounded by what by what I love, so it's like my creative space. I come in here and I'm like floating in space where I that's want to amazing. be. That's amazing. Yeah. Now you you said you were at. You're, this all this project you're doing for the McGill rocket team, rocket propulsion team? Yeah, so I've always been interested in airspace and especially rocket propulsion. And in the past, I've done my own systems like you can see on the wall. Yeah. Uh, but recently, I've been sort of abduct, abducted by the rocket team to work on their uh, engine design that will submit at the uh, Launch Canada competition, which is the first, well, supposedly the first uh, rocket competition, like student mm -hmm. rocket competition in Canada. So we're kickstarting this this sort of new age of, of student rocketry and, and, and uh, sort of amateur aerospace uh, technologies. Um, and so we're trying to go big. And since it's the first Canadian competition, we've always bought our engines and applied it inside of a okay. shell that we've made ourselves. And so for the first time, we're designing from scratch a student research and design engine. Yeah. How, how long does this process take from, from because you're not doing it from scratch? Like, I mean, um, the students have been doing it from scratch, um, we are basing ourselves off of a preliminary design that has been uh, done for a capstone project. So a project of uh, end of bachelor, and we're just improving it and adapting to our needs. Uh, yeah. But to be honest, I think it's, it's, they've been working on it for about two to three years. A rocket engine is not easy to make. There's a lot of theory behind it. And I then bet. you have to apply that theory to a model and then that model you manufacture it. Uh, and I, I swooped in at the right moment to be able to enjoy the work of <laughs> yeah. all my predecessors and apply it to the physical mm -hmm. engine. Yeah. Now, I, I, I love people with, with such grand visions. Now, I just want to know why is space exploration so important, according to you? 
Oh, wow. Uh, that's an excellent question. And actually, a friend of mine, um, Julien Otis Laferriere, the captain of, of the Rocket team, and mm -hmm. asked me that question. And, and it allowed me to, to think about it a lot. Why am I doing all of this? And to be honest, um, we, we often, as, as, as a group of people, as humanity, um, only ally, ally ourselves or, or come into a, a homogeneous group with the same objective when we're faced to a big challenge. Um, when we're facing a global pandemic, right. we ally together, we send supplies yeah. through our border, Co borders. Camaraderie of it all. Exactly. When we face a world war, we make alliances that last for decades. And it, having a challenge which involves multiple countries is a way to accelerate progress and, and make bigger bonds between countries. And the biggest challenge there currently is in science is space exploration as literally mm -hmm. everything you do is something new in space and every day we learn something new that changes the game like recently we learned that there's some some bioscience some biomarkers in the atmosphere of uh, venus yeah like, i saw uh, that very exciting and, and venus everything tries to crush you right like you're breathing in a sulfuric acid you had hundreds of atmospheres of pressure the greenhouse gases like are increasing the, the atmosphere temperature by hundreds mm -hmm. of kelvins. So everything out there is trying to actively kill you. And so we're, we're rooted, we're instinctively humans. We're, you know, we're, we're biological machines, we're mm -hmm. animals. And so to, it's rooted in our DNA to explore because that's how a species become, becomes dominant. They, yeah. they explore, they conquer land, territory, and they expand their, their, their control and, and in our roots, in our DNA, humans have always explored because it's intrinsic to our nature. Absolutely. Uh, we've explored the oceans, we've explored the, the Arctics, the mountains, and, and now there's not much less to see on Earth. We've, we've, every little parcel of Earth is, is registered on Google Maps. And so we've got to keep on exploring to keep right. feeding this inner passion of, 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 of exploration. And that's why space is so important. It's because A, it feeds our desire and our curiosity to explore, and B, it allows us to unite in that incredible feat. Uh, no, I, I totally agree. Um, it's, there's just so much out there still that we, we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. And, and that kind of led me to think, sometimes we explore, you know, we don't exactly have an, well, we have a vision, but we don't have the specific end in mind that sometimes, sometimes a lot of the times we explore and then we just improvise along the way and we actually come to great discoveries, mm -hmm. great like uh, advances. And Absolutely. what do you, what do you, what do you see in like, in, in, in terms of benefits in, for, in the long term, in the short term of space exploration? Literally everything you do in space exploration, and, and that's contrary to a lot of, of, of beliefs. Um, I remember in, in the time of the, uh, of the Vietnam War where the, the American government was investing a lot of money in space exploration. Mm -hmm. People were saying like, you know, we have problems at home. Why are you trying to escape? Why are you trying to go away? And, yeah. and what do I see? It's what is there to gain? There's, there's two aspects of it. There's the science of it and the social impact. And I'll start with the science. Everything you do in space exploration is cutting edge. So you're, you're creating new technologies. You're finding new processes. And when yeah. you find these new processes, you enable a whole new branch of science sometimes where you realize mm -hmm. that, well, you can have propulsion made with these new elements. And so there's funding that's put into it. And then yeah. commercial partners realize that there's money to make out of it. And so there's more investment. And so you kickstart some fields of science. And then what NASA does is that they invest in some technologies and then make them open source or, or open patents. So everyone can uh, apply them and, 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 mm -hmm. and, you know, develop the economy with it. And there, there is, there is a, a report out there that says that every patent that's that NASA has filed an open patent has generated thirty six thousand dollars for the American taxpayer because okay. companies see that potential and say, well, these ceramic tiles that NASA has yeah. developed, we can use them in our car brakes. That's amazing. It's a new generation technology, and our car brakes can be more performant. You know that that's what happened to the the tiles of the space shuttle, where they were like, well, this technology we can apply it to have more performant brakes and decrease the accident rates of a lot because brakes are mm -hmm. more performant. You have more like quicker reaction times right? yeah. for your cars to break. And so, so everything we do in space is cutting edge, a lot of money invested, which comes back to the taxpayer. And then the societal impact of it is, um, and to come back to the, the Vietnam War situation um, and, and, and make a parallel with today. So it was 1968, right? 
um, in the, the midst of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember exactly which Apollo mission it was. Okay. But it was the first time that they went behind the moon. And so everything is going bad. You have the Vietnam War, people marching in the streets, economy is not going well, and people are complaining. And then they decide to launch this mission to go behind the moon. And they go behind the moon, and when they come back off the orbital trajectory, they see the Earth just behind the moon appear. And the astronauts on board took a picture, which is now the famous picture called a earth rise. You know, you have sunrise and you have the earth rise. Oh, man. And it's this picture of this little pale blue dot that's rising behind the moon. And literally all of humanity is in that picture except the astronauts on mm -hmm. board. And, and that picture motivated people to see the value of, of humanity as a whole and not divided. And there's, there's a lot of people that were congratulating the team on the comms yeah. of, of, of Houston. They were saying, oh, nice picture, good job. And then the NASA administration let one call in of a Miss Pringles. They say, no one knows who she is, but she has a pretty relevant message. And all she said was, you saved 1968 with that one picture. And, and if I make the parallel with today, you know, Everything's going bad. The economy is bad. We have a global pandemic. I'm, I'm yeah. talking to you kilometers apart because we're, we're self-isolating. But what, what, what do people say is the one good thing that happened this year, right? We got astronauts on the we did. best, on the most efficient rocket ever made or the most financial efficient rocket ever made in space and back safely and autonomously. That is the one thing that saved this year. So what happens in 1968 with aerospace happens today again. Mm -hmm. Aerospace helps in all fields of life. It's, it's when seeing humanity just does something so impressive that you forget about the little, the, the little conflicts that you have. No, that's amazing. Now, you, exactly. you said a lot of things. I just want to go back to one of the things you said. Um, so space and aeronautics, it's kind of like, it's, 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 it's just pushing the frontiers of technology and knowing that these technologies can benefit other things in so mm -hmm. much, so many domains. Do you have any, any other example? You told me the ceramic, ceramic tiles, the brakes. Can you think of any other examples where this has happened that the space industry benefited some other industry so much? Absolutely. Uh, and, and I can go simply with um, literally internet, like the, my, my, my way of communicating oh, yeah. with you and, and how are we able to work today? How are we able to do all these things from a distance is because we have internet, we have satellites. Well, obviously we have underground cables as well. We have under the sea cables, but for, for, for higher speed of internet or for um, intercontinental rapid transmission, we have satellites mm -hmm. for telecommunications. Why am I able to call my grandma in, in Belgium? It's because we have these, these satellites and, and these were put up there by rockets, right? You need a way to propel right. uh, and, and orbit, like achieve these high speeds necessary for orbit. So literally everything you go and, and see on the internet or, or, or most of the stuff you see on the internet or most of the data is processed and transmitted by satellites. Even eventually the stock market, you know, with the Starlink constellations uh, satellites that SpaceX is putting to orbit, they want to put the stock market through the, the, that network. So the basic fundamentals of our economy will go through space every time. Mm -hmm. That's why space is so important. That's the thing. Yeah. Speaking of the Starlinks, um, isn't, isn't Elon Musk getting into some shit because <laughs> they're they're putting too much debris in space or something, and then the guy, the people astronomer astronomers have difficulty looking at like distant yeah. stars. Yeah, I did see that that post on Reddit and uh, that last week. Um, it's also a problem not only for distant stars because it does it does affect a lot the quality of photographs we're taking now. Um, obviously, like the, the high the high end um, telescopes on Earth have data processing that allows to get rid of these streaks in the sky because uh, mm -hmm. they compare to images. It's more for amateur photography or amateur astrology that oh. you're, you're losing that capacity. Um, the, the bigger danger with, with debris is that we're basically like putting ourselves in a prison, right? We, we just need, it's a bit like nuclear fission. If you have one reaction that goes bad, that creates too many neutrons, or you can't, you, you, you mm. contain too much of ne neutrons and you don't cool the system enough, you have a chain reaction where you have more neutrons right. that, are, that are breaking more molecules apart. And then you, you just have too much neutron debris and you can't handle it anymore. And then you have a, a meltdown. And it's the th same thing in space. You just need one satellite to break apart in the wrong way. 
and hit a, to hit another satellite. And then you've got bolts, nuts, sheets of metal going thousands, like hundreds of meters a second in space. And, and that just creates more debris, right? Because it hits other satellites yeah. and these satellites blow up and, and hit more satellites. And that's just a chain reaction event. And in a couple of weeks, if that phenomenon occurs and, and accentuates, we are stuck on Earth for decades because the time that these low Earth, uh, lower, low Earth orbit parts and satellites slow down because of the low atmospheric drag takes, takes super long. Um, and, and that's just for us, then people in space, like the, like the astronauts. We, the, we've, we've put safety measures on, on the uh, International Space Station, but from time to time, they have to go back in the Soyuz capsule because there's, there's a, a, a debris coming along where they have to make ev 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 evasive sorry, the maneuvers to mm -hmm. avoid objects flying by. Um, so we're starting to pollute. Like, obviously, it's, like, it's almost like Newton, the Newton laws, right? You, to progress, you have to leave some mass behind. It's like the rocket equation. Um, but we're trying to change that. Like, we don't want to progress and leave debris behind. So I know that at least at my university, at McGill University, we're, we're trying mm -hmm. actively to find solutions to that. Um, there's Ina Sharf, one of our professors, that, that's working actively in space yeah. debris removal. But that's why we have to move towards more reusable rockets and reusable boosters. Wait, but let's say let's cont we continue sh sh putting all these objects in space at the current rate. How far are we from this this catastrophic this catastrophic event where one thing leads to another and all the satellites cr start crashing down? Um, at what your question was at what rate? Um, in, like how how f how far is that if we continue at the current rate? Um, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, it's just a question of, it's not even a question of quantity. It's a question of one incident. Uh, it could have happened like 10 years ago and it would have mm. been as bad. It's simply that we have a lot more objects right now. And, and the worst things you can do is then militarize space like they're doing right now oh, with, man. with the Space Force, space et cetera. Force. And, and I think a couple, a couple of years, last year, uh, India uh, shot down one of its satellites to prove that they have the capacities to, shot down, to shoot down a spy satellite Jeez. that created tremendous debris that's now flying at hundreds of, of miles a second mm -hmm. around the earth. So, you know, it's not only about how much we send, but the decisions we make at that. Yeah. I, I heard, I, I listened to this podcast with Joe Rogan and one of the a former NASA astronaut called Garrett Reisman. Yes. And then he he was an astronaut for like. Have you heard of that podcast? Or you just no, you know I haven't name? had the chance. But I know the I know the astronaut. It's it's amazing podcast. He talked about when he was on. I think he was yeah he was on the ISS or something like that. And then there, the the velocity that it goes ar around the Earth, right? And a single droplet of paint it could penetrate the metal. Because mm -hmm. of the speed it is going, and and paint is um it's liquid. Yeah, uh, it, it's dense enough to, to create a lot of, of, of the, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And that's why they have like sheets of aluminum in, yeah. the space yeah, in the space station to try to break apart these molecules so they don't endanger our astronauts up there, researchers in orbit. It is, it is something that we have to consider ab absolutely. And, and even in, in my own designs, I made them to be reusable because yeah. you want to have a way to project a vision of accessible aerospace, but that's also envisioned for sustainability and that's what they teach mm -hmm. us in engineering is sustainability like end of cycle um products and thinking ahead even, yeah thinking ahead and even if it's the hardest i believe aerospace is the hardest engineering there is because they're it, like it's it's never been done before like many of the things you do have never been done before and then on top of all the constraints are literally the most constraints you have i feel like to have a similar level of constraints, you'd have to be like really deep down under the oceans uh, to have the, that, that quantity of, 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 um, of elements you have to take into account to mimic right. the, the stress to, to put stuff into space. Um, and so to consider all of those elements, all of those dangers like radiation, the, the vacuum, the speeds, the, the, how do you dissipate temperature, how do you produce yeah. energy, how do you get there, how do you stay there, all of that and you add life cycle. It's really, diff really difficult. And that's why it's only recently that we've designed reusable rockets. It's extremely difficult, but it, that's what it motivates you for you to want to go to space, right? Absolutely. At the same time. It's because it's the hardest 
the hardest thing there is. And it's, yeah. in my opinion, I think uh, absolutely, if, if you look on, 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 on other professions, like I, I wouldn't be able to be a doctor because I like to, I like to work with inanimate things that I can try and burn. Right. And, and <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do that with my patients. And there's definitely hard, hard professions out there. But I'm mm -hmm. saying that the challenges that we face in, in aerospace are unique in the sense that uh, they, they force you to go ahead and to think uh, to solutions that you would have never found if you weren't facing mm -hmm. that challenge, you know? And yeah, the, no, the scary part is that for so many um, missions is that they often encounter things they didn't think of ahead of time because mm -hmm. in space, there are so many factors. I, I, I heard there was the solar fla flares that come yeah. every in a while. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, they, have to, they have to actually look out for those. And there's a special room in the space station where astronauts go and hide when there's a solar flare. There's not only that, there's like the Allen belt, the uh, Van Allen belt too. Where there's a tell solar me about flare. that. So it's, it's quite funny. It's the first, the, the fun fact about the Van Allen belt, it's, it's a radiation belt going around Earth uh, that concentrates at the poles. And it's the, f the, the thing that was discovered that we decided to nuke the fastest. <laughs> you know, we discover things from time to time. And then yeah. in, in, in a couple of months, the Van Allen, the, the scientist that discovered these radiation belts was like, why, should it, why don't we nuke them to see what happens? It was obviously back in the 60s when we, we had those types of ideas. But the Van Allen belts <laughs> are a sort of a very high density radiation, which uh, is not enough to kill you. But it's enough okay. to, 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 to affect your, your DNA in, in, some, in some ways and maybe create cancer. Right. Obviously, the astronauts that have been to the moon don't have a record of dying young. Um, we, Buzz Aldrin is still alive today and, and thriving. Mm. But it's definitely another thing you have to take into account for long-duration space missions. And if you go further than the sun, if you go out of the solar system, out of the heliosphere, yeah. you have cosmic rays, which are extremely dangerous. And if you put a camera into space, they're so intense that you see it in the camera. You see streaks of light. Um, and that's the cosmic rays that hit the lens. What what their their what are they, what are their their effects on on the human body? Like are are these so, light rays? No, so these are, are um, I would have to look exactly the the, the wave type, the waveform, but these are extremely ex extremely charged particles uh, that travel extremely fast. Right, uh, and it, it basically has the same effect as radiation on your body. It comes in uh, and it can. Um, affect well by by affecting your. I'm not gonna. I'm not a biologist. I'm not gonna go right. deep into that. But from what I understand, it affects your DNA and doesn't allow when when you affect the DNA in some way, you create a mutation and mm -hmm. that mutation changes the function of the cell. And sometimes your cell keeps on reproducing with that faulty DNA after like one branch of it got knocked out by the by the cosmic ray keeps on reproducing even if it's it's not functioning. And that's well, cancer. And that's cancer. So you can create cancer in long duration space missions. And that's what we're wondering. You know, if you put pe people on the moon, uh, they're not protected by yeah. the Earth's magnetic field. Even on Mars, there's not as strong as a, as a, mm -hmm. of a magnetic, magnetic field. So we're looking into underground cave systems, which exist on the moon. Oh, How okay. Go hide in there and make it. Actually, that's, that's what we're supposed to do eventually is has a, have a colony. Right, okay. It's the safest. You don't you don't see those in those uh, Mars renderings very often under cave uh, under under the surface. It's not as exciting, but it is what we're right. considering. So inflatable habitats that we would put underground. Um, but we're still. That's mm. why we have um, the the latest Mars mission um, that uh, in Insight, I think, where they uh, scan the geology of Mars. They send like a rover oh. that looks for not a rover a. Um, a little platform. I think it's a rover that has an articulated arm that drops a, um, a, a sensor on the ground to feel um, seismic waves, to analyze the ground because under it, because that's, right. with seismic waves, you can sort of do an echography, you know, when uh, you scan a, a, a mother's um, uterus for the uh, baby. Yeah, uh, ultrasound. Yeah. Ultrasound, exactly. It's the same concept, yeah, ultrasound. but applied to, it's not ultrasounds, but that's how we can see inside is by looking right, how right. waves re reflect and we're doing it with seismic waves. So when there's a wave, you can analyze how it propagates in the ground and from that make deductions of, of the density and cave systems, etc. So you, there, there's natural cave systems. Natural cave systems. How often are, 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 are they? Uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you, um, but I know that there's been and, and that's a fact. There is liquid water on Mars, um, and there has been oceans before. And where you have oceans, you have mm. water. Where you have water, you have corrosion. And where you have corrosion, you have you have caves. You have air caves, gaps. You have like yeah, exactly. All that comes that's with it. That's crazy.
Yeah, there's actually canyons on Mars. You can see the effects of liquid water still up to this day. What what made this water disappear? I, I I'm not a I don't know anything about space and all of that. So I'll, I'll I'll try to synthesize the best of, that I can. Is that you have two types of water. You have a heavy water, um, and you have lighter water. And we sure. know as a fact that there's a concentration of both. That's always the same in our oceans. And and what happens is that when you don't have a atmosphere thick enough or a gr or a gravity well. Um, intense enough to hold back this water once it evaporates you slowly lose it into space you slowly lose hydrogen into space um, okay. as well and so this water dissipates and leaves the planet um, but the heavy water stays longer on the planet and that's what we still observe today they are mm. we've actually took pictures of polar ice caps on mars and they're composed of a certain percentage of percentage of, of heavy water which is way more than right. usual and so we know that if we make the proportionality, we know that there used to be so much water on Mars that you could have oceans. Uh, wow. And we found minerals on, on certain valleys and on Mars that only form underwater into, uh, under kilometers of water and pressure. So we know that there, there was oceans on Mars. Jesus. Yeah. I, can, I can see Minecraft making a great educational game <laughs> with this, with I Mars. Mean, uh... When I was in high school, I used to play Minecraft, and there was this, uh, yeah, this, hell yeah. this, cra this crack pack uh, called where you could explore Mars and other planets, so I used to do that all the time. Yeah. No, like you could literally study how, how, like the type, I don't know, it'd be pretty complicated after, actually. <laughs> now, we, we talked about earlier the benefits of space exploration in general, but what are some of the, the technological benefits other than obviously living on Mars, but like, Mars, getting on Mars, living on Mars, in what ways can it actually benefit humanity in like, let's say a short term? Short term. Um, the first thing is that we've become a multi-planetary species, which decreases our chance of annihilation and destruction of our own species by half. And because bragging need, rights. Yeah. Bra bragging rights to all the <laughs> other species we know, yeah. <laughs> all, the other, all the alien life. Um, yeah. I, by, by that, I mean that if we end up destroying ourselves, we still have a outpost of human life mm -hmm. somewhere out there that's still surviving and that's independent. And that's what Elon Musk is saying. You know, he's saying before yeah. we destroy ourselves, we better put human over there. And that's why I want to do it by the end of this de decade or, or whatever, because he, he doesn't know about the future. Um, so right. in, in immediate term, we become that type of civilization, which is able to inhabit different planets. Then in the immediate term, you um, have humans on an outpost on another planet, and that opens tremendous amounts of research. Well, how does the human biology adapt to a lesser gravity? How do mm. we adapt to, to radiation? And, and with that, we can find new surgery methods in low gravity. We can find new alternatives, oh, and, okay. and we open a new branch of science. And so it is, it is known that some chemicals are way easier to produce in the ISS, in the International Space Station. Oh, yeah, I heard about because that. Because of, yeah. of low, low, low gravity. So we might find some processes in metallurgy or other fields of science which are mm -hmm. easier on the red planet, on Mars. Um, and so that's in the immediate term. And if we talk about the, quickly, the medium term, you get people like me that are super inspired by what we're doing, what humans are capable right, of. Right, right. A whole generation of, of, of young STEM inspired kids that just want to get involved and eventually reach university. Absolutely. And involved in rocket teams and et cetera, and just want to bring more to the table that, than what's already there. Uh, and, and you cannot go wrong when you inspire kids to educate themselves. No, I, I, I yeah, no, take you for example. I wonder how many, how, how much scientific progress are due to kids who were inspired by these out of the world stunts. I don't know, you can't, can you call them stunts? Yeah, they are. To, to, to be frankly honest, like yeah. many of these missions were, were not 100% sure to succeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's their reaction to, there's always a group of people who say, you know, uh, Musk, Bezos, Blue Origin, you know, these guys are, are, are just thinking of a way to get out there, but they're not using the resources to save the planet we're living on right now. What's usually the counter argument to that? To, to use, so like often people say that, like you're escaping yeah. your problems and you're, it's like a, a Elysium, if you've seen the movie where you yeah. have this, this like outpost of, of yeah. those people that live on Mars and that are safe or on uh, outer, out of the earth. Mm -hmm. And I'll take Elon Musk's answer because his answer is perfect. Okay. Is that 
everything in space is actively trying to kill you. So you have, you have this planet that's thermally regulated to perfection, that has clean, pure air, c clean water that you can just drink from the source, that's, that provides food, shelter, and on which you're comfortable. Mm -hmm. And you think rich people are looking at space as somewhere to escape. We have our escape. We have spaceship Earth. We don't need anything more. Uh, but what they are seeing is a potential for profit, for asteroid mining, for, for, for exploration of space and putting satellites in space. There is a commercial opportunity. And, and that is absolutely necessary. And that what, what's, what was a big change that we had to adapt to and what older generations that, had see, that have seen the space program in its debuts and, and now yeah. have to adapt to is that space went from a pure scientific thing to now a commercial thing. Um, mm. And... and People like like Neil Armstrong and and Buzz Aldrin have testified against Elon Musk and and saying that his ideas are not valuable and we shouldn't fund these opportunities and and that was pretty pretty hard for him because Elon yeah. Musk because these are heroes of his role models yeah exactly but he kept on pushing and what he's doing now is that he's showing that it's possible to make space financially like that the space means makes sense financially that you can still make a profit if you invest yeah. in space and so by driving down the costs you increase accessibility and so now more research groups can put their own satellites in orbit and stuff like that so um these 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 people like jeff bezos and 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 elon musk i'm not saying that they're they're a hundred percent well intentioned i'm sure there's some 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 capitalistic motive behind that but it's no definitely helping us in some way um and and listen Elon Musk is taking, uh, well, is giving the opportunity for us to go back commercially in, in, in a financially meaningful manner to the moon on a uh, permanent basis. Obviously, NASA has, has have their own plans, but they um, are looking more into the science of things. So sending a few groups of people um, mm -hmm. to study on the moon. But these, these companies are allowing people like, like citizens of, 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 of the world to, to test yeah. out these technologies and explore for themselves. So while we are saying, well, you know, uh, they're in for the money, they are giving us opportunities that in, in the end we might enjoy. Um, and he's sending 12, I think 12 or 11 um, artists to the moon. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, poets, c cinematographs, uh, well, cinematograph in French, um, photographers yeah. uh, and other other artists and, and people of, of, of many talents to go and, and, and explore and see the movie oh, for man. themselves. Yeah. He said, what, I think it was, it was, he was mentioning Beethoven or, or, or Mozart and he was saying, imagine the, the, the imagine the, the art that would have came from seeing the moon with their own eyes, mm. what we would get from it. And, and that's what he wants to do. He wants to inspire people. And some people might say it's a PR stunt, which probably is, but at least he does it in a way that inspires people. In the way I see it, the level of artistic, uh, like a tick you would get only if, like, if you take heavy doses of like a hallucin hallucinogenics versus going on the moon. No, I, I definitely see it. Exactly. That's insane. And we, we talked about, we're going to get to the private privatization of space in a bit, but First of all, I, I always wanted to know when we say asteroid mining and how and it's going to be the most profitable thing from from this. What exactly is the material that we want it? We we would look to get to to make all this financially make sense. Absolutely everything. There are quantity of ores out there in the Kuiper Belt uh, behind behind Mars that that are beyond our wildest dream uh, they're con we, we we know through spectrom spectrometry and we've actually like mm -hmm. like sort of um orbited and landed on asteroids and we've been able to analyze their composition oh, right. and we know as a fact that there's trillions and trillions of dollars of ores of iron of copper and all these other materials in the asteroid belt because you know earth is just a, a bunch of asteroids collided together with some mm -hmm. water and some life <laughs> like we we are we are a bunch of asteroids so what you find in on earth you find it in the creeper belt and the the idea is that we would be able to get the resources we need for our expansion throughout the solar system without mining our own earth and without damaging oh, right it. 
So the idea is to, is to go get one of these asteroids and put it into orbit around Earth and slowly mine it because you'd have enough iron to supply the whole world for 25 mm -hmm. years on one of those asteroids. So definitely there's a, there's a financial objective behind that. But once again, we end up winning out of it because we get access to ores without damaging, um, damaging the planet. And so, yeah, it is interesting. Without dealing with uh, people who live on the asteroid and all the unethical stuff, you know, <laughs> colonization. I mean, we'll have to adopt, uh, adapt space law for those things. And there are like, yeah. like legal careers that you can do in space law to, to, to work up the legislation for, for those, those things. Yeah. That's going to be so insane where, you know, you know, when they used to say like uh, this percent of jobs back didn't even exist back then, right? Now yeah. we're looking at space. Uh, you go on LinkedIn, you have a space section. You yeah. just enroll in space activity. That's going to be insane. It's an industry that's booming. It's, it's yeah. exploding. And, and there's a reason why our own government is, is pledging a billion dollars for space development to increase the, the CSA budget, the Canadian Space Agency. And ourselves, well, the, the Canadian Space Agency is allocating way more funds than it usually does to now space mm -hmm. exploration programs and, and new technologies such as the Canada Arm 3 that has been announced uh, in partnership with MDA. We just put RadarSat, which are, is, a, is our new constellation of satellites of Canada for our own geo tracking. Um, we've, we've done many things in the past years um, showing our interest as a country to space and we have to. Listen, yeah. Montreal, the city we live in, is the third best city in the world for aerospace after Seattle with Boeing and Toulouse for Airbus. We live in the epicenter of, of Canadian aerospace. And, and huh. I feel like sometimes you don't realize our luck that the, the, the field of the future, well, AI is the field of the future, but AI <laughs> aerospace. One of the, the fields that will increase the most in the next years is, is in Montreal with Bell Helicopter, yeah. with Bombardier, et cetera, et cetera. No, I don't have a metro station named after the aerospace center so we're, we're really up there <laughs> yeah. uh, so we talked about the privatization of space now how has privatization accelerated this i mean we see the effects of it but what are like the, the underlying things that mechanisms that make it so exciting uh first thing is uh just getting hands on before it was a question of having hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to access space technology, get your yeah. hands on it, work on it and improve it. Now you've got all these startups that are able to 3D print their own engines, that are able to, the, the technology and the science has been so democratized by these space agencies. Like you can go on, on Google and Google anything related to a rocket engine and find, find a NASA, NASA paper, a NASA link that will explain it to you. Um, and um, this, this democratization of space and these technologies have allowed a lot of these companies to expand and to, to create, you know, you, you, have, you have startups even in, in St. Jean Solary Chalier, the space um, oh, sorry, wow. reaction dynamics you have in Toronto space, right? These startups that are starting and, and from, yeah. from scratch to design space systems, which was inimaginable before. Um, and what that yeah. allows is students like me to get internships and to get their hands on it too because before to, to mm -hmm. get my hands on space systems i would have to have a phd or a master's and and then yeah. i would get i would get to touch a satellite but now i can do it at my school you know we're just yeah. doing sets at mcgill and and, and and rocket propulsion systems so all that all that access to technology and information because of all that these resources poured into uh into open patents allowed allows these companies to access to so privatiz privatization of space obviously but with privatization of space you get more jobs in the space sector which which increases um the interest for space mm. because now there's actually a way to make a living out of it so more people are interested yeah. in it there's more momentum for it it's it's just a win-win situation so there's that there's the fact that more more people get to have their their hands on it uh but then it also the fact that space is becoming something more more and more of a commodity so something more and more common in our everyday lives uh, because we're exposed to it make right. space programs uh, more um, accessible to legislators you know they mm -hmm. see how there is a financial backing to all these these need to uh, all this need to adapt the laws and to make space more accessible uh, in in many ways so legislation adapts and allows students to eventually launch an own right right we have a big problem in canada where uh, legislation is not keeping up with technology uh, and, and in the States, there's the fa famous example of, 
of all the Senate, uh, Senate, sorry, uh, trying to understand the CEO of Google talking. Oh man, that was and, that was yeah. a hard thing to watch. And we make fun of Americans, but we're not better because um, if you want to test a rocket engine, or sorry, if you want to test a rocket, if you want to launch a rocket as a student design team, your best bet is to go to the states. Is to go to the states and uh, go with Tripoli or one of these uh, associations of rocketeers of, of amateur rocketeers and mm. test it in the states. So it's actually easier to go through the states, the United States border, with rocket a rocket in the back and and rocket fuel in the back, or you you get your fuel in the states, right? Then to do it in in Canada in your in your home country because our legislation hasn't keep kept up with the progress in that field. And here we have student teams making advanced space systems but not being able to test them in their own country. So we need to adapt our laws and and something that's great and that I want to insist on why yep. privatization of space is so good is is that the example of New Zealand. New Zealand has always been a, a country lagging behind technology-wise because of its, its distance from mainland. Mm -hmm. um, but then you have this company, Space, uh, sorry, Rocket Lab. Rocket Lab is a, a, a originally a startup, a, a, a launch services company. So they provide okay. launch, they launch your satellite, put it into orbit so you can, um, and, and they activate your satellite and now they do the tracking. And they were starting in a company, in a, sorry, in a, in, a, in a country where laws didn't keep up with the technological advances. Right. Um, and, and here you have, you have their CEO, uh, Peter Beck, that wants to allow his company to exist. So he put so much effort into making legislation progress that now New Zealand is one of the leaders of the space industry. And they, they decided to, to, to be in New Zealand. Why? Even if it was a country that, that wasn't up to date in, in aerospace legislation, it was because uh, New Zealand is, is well known for their sailing, right? For the sailboats, because they have yeah. a lot of wind, a lot of coastline. So they have an extremely good carbon fiber manufacturing process over there for all these sailboats. And effectively, they've decided to use that material in rockets with Rocket Lab. And so they say, you know, we have this technology, we're leaders in our field, we have to find a way to, to exploit it and make New Zealand a right. leader in this industry. And that's what these, this private company has allowed, is that now launches are possible from New Zealand, which is, was not possible before, and they've made leg legislation progress. And obviously they are also based in the States where it's easier but they've changed the, the whole perception of a government mm. on space technology. And so that's why it's so important because these companies have the, the resources to lobby, to influence governments yeah. for the good of humanity. So now we're going to have a financial incentive to write more laws, make more the regulation, re legislat legislatures. So that's going to make technology boom right here in Canada. Absolutely. Uh, and, and we have a lot to... We have, to, we have a lot of potential. Uh, listen, in Canada, we had the best fighter jet in the world. At Walmart. Really? Um, I don't remember exactly the name. I'd have to look it up. Um, we, ha we, ha we, were, we were ahead in so many things. I think McGill was where the first uh, browser was, was made. I think it was called Archie or something like that. I'm not totally sure, but to, to, to mention the, um, the, uh, the fighter the jet. Best, the fighter jet. Oh, I, I can't <laughs> find it. I was looking, I was looking online cricket. Quickly, right. but um, it's it's this this fight the typh no not the typhoon I, I'll find it eventually um, where we had the the best stealth technology we had the best maneuverability mm. and all of that in Canada but then funding got cut by the government for that program so we had the leading the leading assault uh, the, the leading military plane in the world which opened many doors for commercialization and, and making Canada make a statement yeah. in the world of Canada's place in aerospace, but we cut funding for it. Uh, and, and that has been the same for many aerospace companies, which just mm. have repeated, like continuously progressed, developed incredible technology with, the, with Canadian, Canadian minds and then sold it every time. And, and now we're fighting to keep those here. And I feel like a big part of it is getting the government on board, which they are more and more. Um, right. So I'm happy to be part of the generation where things are about to shift and change. We see the government investing in aerospace, taking their time to value it. And that's yeah. really important, just generally for society and, and mankind. That, that's super exciting. I, it's quite a time to be alive. I told this to, to, to all my guests who are, who are dreaming <laughs> so big and it's, it's you know, it's true.
said so a girl that I had last time, Elishba Imran, she is deep in the blockchain, machine learning, uh, democrat, democrat, I, I can't pronounce words nowadays. Democratizing, yeah. <laughs> D- democratizing um, yeah, exactly. banks and then stuff like that. It's insane technology that she's been trying to do. And we talked about earlier um, going to the States to launch a rocket. Now, I know that's what you did because I saw the video of you carrying a rocket to the States (laughs) and launching it in the States. (laughs) Yeah. How old were you when that happened? I was 18. I was 18 and it it was, I'm I'm, I'm telling you now, every time I go to any border, any security, I get checked. Like, it's just constant. Like, it's, oh, we have to random check you. But I understand. This is not every day. You might have a rocket here in the back of your car just now. Yeah. You know, like I got got there early at the border and I was like, I know this is not going to be fun for you, but I have rocket in the back and I have all the necessary equipment. I'll explain. Jesus. And we had a laugh, but I'm, I'm sure he flagged my... He flagged my name somewhere because then going to, yeah. going to ski in J Peak takes me two hours. Just keep just bringing rockets break. over the border, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, now they're getting more more used to it. Uh, obviously, right. the border will reopen. We'll be uh, able to go back with the rocket team to Spaceport America Cup um, right. because now there's a spaceport. I don't know if, if people know about the it, space sport. You, you know how pe- we have like airports and we have like maritime ports. We now have oh oh a oh a spaceport. port. I I thought you meant a sport. <laughs> No, 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 no. We have a port. Uh, it's it's okay. in, it's in, in New Mexico, um, in uh, Truth and Consequences, the city, um, and it's the first time that a space port has been made. Well, you have John F. Kennedy Center, but that was that was okay. more of a more of a governmental research center. So we have a, a commercial spaceport, and that's where we go to for our competitions right. uh, for the rocket team. We were supposed to go this summer, um, and I was Ooh. supposed to go with the team, but obviously got canceled. But that allows us more time to to further better to better our design and to work on on other things that we the want competition to. is about launching rockets right launching rockets so you've got well, students from yeah. all over the world uh, that come even from from denmark uh, and you're competing against you know we have we have a decent budget we would always love more if any um, administration uh, person from miguel's listening. shout, shout out shout out to them. yeah we always make great great things you know every, for sure is every Penny is wisely invested, but you've got company, uh, you've got universities like University of Michigan that have like enormous budgets for oh, the rocket have, team because yeah, yeah we're Purdue University that are designing the the world's um, leading technologies in, in propulsion, um, but we get to compete against those people and in 2018 the, the team won like we won like the first place I, I say we as the team I wasn't there obviously uh, no. but there it shows that. Um, it, you know, I think it, I read on Slack the other day, 80% of the awards were won by Canadian teams with lesser, lesser budgets than Canadian teams. So Canada has an amazing potential. We just have to tap into it and allow it to, to grow and expand. What, why, is, why is that, that we have a smaller budget, but we were able to win so many of these? Um, we it forced have us to be creative or something? I, I, have, I have a theory that struggle makes greatness. Because mm. when you have, and once again, that's the whole theory about why space is so great. It's because when we're faced against obstacles, it forces us to think more, not just spend money. Um, right. And a, a, a reason behind that, an example behind that is that I'll show you. I have um, right here, I have a nozzle. Uh, and I'm showing it because I know that um, people won't be able to see it because this is team yeah. protected uh, um, material and, and design. This, this nozzle costs a lot to make. Uh, this is about two hundred and fifty dollars, three hundred dollars okay. to make. And this nozzle, sure. so nozzle is the back of the engine. It's where you expand the gases into the air. And this yeah. is made of graphite because graphite is a really resistant material um, in, in in high temperatures. Um, and graphite is a nightmare to machine. And so uh, usually, you know, when you you launch a rocket, you want like new components because it's it's more performant. Uh, but we don't we don't have the you don't, you don't have the resources to make a new nozzle every time. So it forced me in charge of the nozzle to understand how we can remachine an old nozzle to make it performant enough for our new engine. So we're taking a nozzle that we use in old engines that are mm. completely different from what we're doing now to this new engine. We're using the same one. And it forced me to look into the theory, to understand what I can change in this model to make it 
as efficient for the other as efficient for this new this new engine right and and then i understand better the material that i'm working with the theory because i have struggled i couldn't just buy a new, right, right. A new nozzle and, and make it exactly like i need it mm -hmm. i had to understand which components which elements of the design can i maybe not care about and say yeah you know, it's not that important which ones affect performance so it forced me to think more and to, to learn more about the theory so i think that those 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 obstacles force you to, to reflect a bit more and to understand better. And so that's why teams in Canada usually perform more because having less resources, we have to find more innovative solutions. So 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 in some way we should keep it that way. We keep the resources. <laughs> I'd say maybe not keep the resources low, but increase, but the right constraints. Exactly, increase the budget proportionally with the number of projects. Maybe mm. you can have more projects, more people working on on. Because you know, there's there's only a number of things you can do on a rocket engine. At some point, you have a team of, of six, seven people working on it. Okay. And, yeah. and then it, and then you can't divide tasks more because you have to really dive deep to understand the material. Yeah. So having more engines being produced or or having more experimental work mm. being done. This this summer, I had the chance to work on uh, an experimental version of uh, of of a rocket engine. So you know how aerospace is is all about efficiency every single 0.001% efficiency gain is is great because you save on fuel yeah. uh, if if your rocket is more efficient you save on fuel fuel less fuel means less uh, a smaller tank to hold that fuel less weight yeah less weight less fuel etc it's a cycle that continues and so i got the chance this summer to work uh, in research in aerospace research in um, experimental prop, uh, propulsion for rocket engines, where we use pressure gain combustion instead of, of traditional um, rocket engines to make more efficient uh, rocket engines to be able to decrease uh, the, the cost in fuel. And uh, I've worked with the rotating detonation engine this summer, where uh, we use a cot continuously wrapping a uh, detonation wave to mix our oxidizer and, 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 and propellant or propellant to mix our propellant more uh, mm -hmm. homogeneous homogeneously uh, to get a better com a pure combustion right um, and that could lead to key fuel savings of up to 25 percent and 25 percent in the scope of aerospace is like a miracle um, and so, mm. you know, with more funding, we would be able to do more of these things or test our engine more frequently or progress yeah. faster. Um, and so we're doing amazing work at McGill. Just to say, I'm, I'm working under Professor Andrew Higgins, which is a, a, a now uh, leader in, in a world leader in, in propulsion devices. Oh, wow. and Shout out to Mr. Higgins. <laughs> and interstellar flight. Um, and, and it's it's just having you know the 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 capacity to draw in, in funding and for that for that stuff at work is, is really amazing and i i got the chance to work on the thermal um the thermal optimization of this engine because this engine is so performant at producing energy that it basically destroys itself uh, by, by overheating because of the continuously uh, yeah, yeah the energy it produces waves. exactly so you have to find a way to actively cool it down so that's what i worked on um and and obviously having worked at the rocket team at the same time and yeah and and doing this this internship this research internship um really it really allows you to understand more and i feel like without the the funding that my professor got through through, through the government it would be harder for him to get students on board uh because they yeah, wouldn't absolutely. be salary attached to it, it and all those things so you get people like me that actually have experience now and in a couple of years when i finish my degree i can go directly into any industry and and be an asset for them and not they don't have yeah. to teach me everything again i can even bring something to the team so that's why funding is so important a lot of leverage no absolutely uh the competition you mentioned i was really intrigued by that so i have so many questions go how ahead. big are the rockets that you're doing exactly uh, I would say about 10, 10 to ten to twelve feet. Um, so they're pretty oh, big. Okay, I, was, I thought you were about to say meters. I was like, That's no, 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 no. Uh, I mean, it depends. It depends which competitions, because you've got um, you've got Launch Canada, which is uh, they have experiment, experimental rocketry. They have regular rocketry where you reach like ten thousand feet or fifteen thousand feet, and mm. those those competitions because. Rocketry, you can always go faster. You could always go higher and stuff like that. But the, the magic in rocketry is precision. So what they're doing is instead of saying like the team that goes the highest or the team that goes the fastest, they say the team that is the most creative in their work. And you, you give yourself an objective, either 15,000 feet or 10,000 feet or 30,000 feet. And it's the closest you get to that to that to that to that height, your mm -hmm. apogee. So where your rocket stops uh, increasing in altitude. Yeah. 
is, is worth a lot in those competitions. So how close can you get to there without going over or under? So it forces you to really understand all the concepts of drag, of, of, of forces okay, and loads yeah, on the vehicle. Yeah. Instead of just saying, like, like, let's just the for the highest one wins exactly okay yeah and, and but you do have competitions like base 11 base 11 is a competition uh, for which um mm -hmm. we in which we were mcgill mcgill rocket team had invested a lot of time and energy and resources into it um it's basically a a a, a, mo a space shot so the first university team to get a rocket in space and so you go and then then the diameter of your rocket like doubles the height almost follows yeah. and so you get you get huge rockets right you get massive rockets that can go that can actually reach space um, and there's a million dollar prize linked to that competition it's called base 11 competition I think, base 11 i'm gonna yeah. put it in the description yeah concordia is doing it uh, miguel rocket team was involved with it um, sadly we realized that it was taking too much of a toll on the team because the team um, is you know we we've had we have limited resources limited personnel yeah, yeah. and at some point you just have to make decisions right and and Julien Tissapier the, the captain of the team last year had to make the difficult decision to pull out of of the co-captain sorry the co-captain of the team had to make a the difficult difficult decision to pull out of this competition because we don't have the resources to lead launch Canada Space Sport America Cup and Base Eleven right too and many so once again them. it's all it's always just a question of resources i mean if we had like an actual like actual an actual machine shop to ourselves we could do way more if we had mm -hmm. more funding we could buy more materials to test more like, experimental materials and, right. and engine concepts if we had uh, an easier access to a, a test site that we don't have, like right now um i i'm working on on with 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 the rocket team on the first um engine out, outdoor engine test site in montreal um, it's in the West Island where we bought a container. Uh, we uh, on the McDonald campus uh, where we were pouring, we poured concrete on the ground. We put a container and we're putting all our plumbing system, all our our gases, our propellant, and we're we're basically building this test rig to test our engines. Mm -hmm. And you know, you you could always go to some to, to some manufacturer and say, listen, we need a we need a test stand to test a rocket engine. Can you make can you make one for us? It would be it would be optimized. But we made our own with extrusions of of aluminium, and we made the FEAs or the the stress analysis on on free free student software and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> we had to Jeez. we had to figure something out and so yeah yeah we're you know uh i i was there last weekend bushwhacking and, and and clearing up the site because we can't hire someone to do it so the rocket engineers uh, have to yeah. clear the site by hand which is fun you know it gets it gives you the time to talk to the mm -hmm. to, to your teammates but it's all it's always a question of resources and if we had because now we're sharing our space our design space with another team with aero uh, aero which is another it's an aerospace team for for drones and um, so we don't have that much space so i have to store all this stuff here because we can't access that it, explains so we have less space so it's like it's all a question of resources if if we got more funding from maybe mcgill which we're we are really grateful for the funding we have already but mm -hmm. if you had a bit more you know also time is 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 is, is, is a resource so it all comes down to that. If we have more time and more more resources to allow more people on the team to be able to keep all these competitions, you know, how much have I learned from Space Bird America Cup or Launch Canada? And how much would I learn if we had the resources to do Base 11? Right. Yeah. Resource, that way it propels education. Exactly. Are these competitions annual? Annual competitions. They were canceled this year because of COVID, uh, but these are annual competitions. and. We participate every year, definitely. And so the incentive, like if you win the competition, what really benefits you is the recognition and then you probably get more funding if you keep winning these competitions. Definitely. It shows it shows to the university that their money is going somewhere and right, the yeah. is really adamant on its reputation. So if you go, uh, if you caress their back and you, you know, you scratch them in the right way mm -hmm. and they give you, they give you more candy. So in Canada, is it, is it mostly only McGill, Concordia, Montreal base, or do we also have in other provinces? We, uh, in, so in Canada, rocketry, rocketry is, is huge elsewhere. We have the, I think the, the most advanced, uh, rocket propulsion, um, experimental research facilities in Calgary. 
Um, I don't sure. remember exactly the name of the professor. Um, I, I met him in a, in a meeting about, about Rocket Team. So we, we flew him out while well, he flew to Montreal and was able to review uh, our test site and how we're doing things to wow. make sure that it makes sense. Um, because he, he came to see Professor Higgins. Um, so we, we, and we are supervised. The Rocket Team is currently supervised by Professor Higgins. Um, so I, we are pretty, like I'd say, we're pretty well placed in Canada as, as Quebec and Montreal. Montreal is the third best city in the world for aerospace. And most of the, the universities that perform at these competitions are in Quebec. Uh, but it's, it's pretty good elsewhere. You know, University of Victoria is also good. Uh, mm. You've got different universities throughout Canada that are investing a lot. Yeah, That's good for us. Good for us. Who, who are the, the first two leading? There was Seattle and... Seattle and Toulouse in France. Toulouse. Yeah, Toulouse for Airbus. So, you know, Seattle is the, oh, is the okay, yeah. headquarters of, of Boeing and then you got Airbus, which is the other big player. I think Now, like Boeing and Airbus are sharing like a market share of 80% in aerospace, in, oh, in, at least in, yeah. And then you have Bombardier that has like six or seven percent corner, corner yeah, slice. That, that is dropping now. So um, we're trying our best. <laughs> and we're still third in the world. So yeah, we I have mean, a bit of a head start. Exactly. And to, to give you an idea of, of how Quebec is important or Montreal is important in, in aerospace, the headquarters of the space agency for the whole country is a 20 minute drive from my apartment in Montreal. Because they know, yeah, yeah, they, yeah they, they know it's actually, it's actually in Saint-Hubert. It's Saint-Hubert. Oh, okay. uh, it's, it's in Brossard, yeah. So they, they know that the, the intellectual or the, the, the minds of aerospace are in Montreal, are in Quebec. So that's mm. why they're here. Yeah. That's amazing. They made a they made a snowmobile and now look where they are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Sure. So how how old are you now? You're in univer which year are you? I'm in my second I'm in my second year of university. Uh, I am 20 years old. And when you were 18, you went to the States, you launched this rocket. Now yes, how, which I how started did, when yeah. I was 17. How did you get there? Are you in seven, so you did it all in one year? Yeah, I did it all in one year. So well a year and a half. So you designed this you, You start by designing your fuel, you need a fuel, you need an engine, you need an avionic yeah. system, you need a bunch of things. Basically, like all aspects of science, uh, pr programming, materials, all of that is covered. Mm -hmm. uh, even biology, if you're doing an experiment in, in, the, in the bay. So um, you have to get invested in all those fields. And I'd say that um, it, it was a challenge to, in a year and a half, mm -hmm. design a rocket from scratch. Yeah. No, so, but did you... Did this passion for rockets ha exist? Why well, I'm sure it had existed, but how did you, where did you find this passion for rocketry in space? Good, good question. I've, I've simply just always been driven to space. Uh, and, and there's the final frontier thing. There's, it's, but I just find it so mesmerizing. You know, my mm. background, my background is, is the view from the, the, they call it the Hublot. So it's basically this, this bay in the ISS where you have a couple of, of windows that give onto the earth. And that's my background because it's just so beautiful to see. It's, it's the be most beautiful sight there is, mm. you know, to see space and to see earth. And it's just majestic. And so I've always been drawn to it. And actually, I, I gave a talk at, at Brebeuf, my, my high school, um, last week where um, I show a picture of me when I'm 10. Uh, I'm 10 years old and I'm in my element, elementary school in my class. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and I write right under the picture in my sort of agenda, like they make you keep up a yep. journal. And I say, one day I'll work at NASA because I love robotics and technology. And, and, and since that age, I've, I knew, and even before I have, I think I have in my, in my closet, I'm not sure where, <laughs> I have a journal, uh, an engineering journal, you know, like engineers mm -hmm. have notebooks in which they, I have right. one from when I was six years old where I was designing oh, okay. satellites. Well, obviously okay. there were like, there was nothing like really realistic about that. The idea was there. I, I, have, a, I have a bunch of, of, of asteroid mining satellites in this gray notebook in, 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 my, uh, in my closet. So I've just always been driven to space and to design and to engineering. And it just, just translates now in my ability to do 16 hour days on just doing rocketry all day. And, and it. it's absolutely fun. It's like, it's not a burden at all. It's, it's just living your best life in a way. Uh, well, I mean, at some point you've got to sleep and you've got to eat yeah, uh, yeah, and you've yeah. got to do a bit of exercise. Fundamentals. Uh, I try to keep myself in shape, but it's fun. I, I love it. And the team mm -hmm. that I'm working with is amazing for my own projects too. Whenever I'm, I'm for my research in, internship this summer, you know, I was pretty much left to myself. They said, 
Um, I was supposed to work in the lab and test the RD, okay. so the rotating detonation engine, and, yeah. and to allow it. We have a we have a prototype of this of this um, of this groundbreaking engine, and I was supposed to work on it on the physical model, but you know the lab got closed because of COVID. So my professor was like, my supervisor was like, you know, I I don't know what to give to you this summer. You were supposed <laughs> to do this. And so he was like, you know what? What do you want to do? And I said, I want to work on the engine. And he said, well, you can. So what do you want to do? And I said, I'm working on that engine and I'm going to figure out a way. And I was like, well, I can look into materials. So for a month and a half, I was looking into really advanced um, ceramics mm. for the for the, the engine to resist high temperatures. And looked, I looked into ways to manufacture these ceramics through pyrolysis. This was the, your first rocket the, 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 when you were 17 or right no, now? No, this was, the, this is my, my, okay. my oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I was looking into that, and then eventually I, I got into thermal analysis using using CFD and, and computational mm. fluid dynamics software. But to, to go back to my first my first rocket, um, to give you an idea, um, you know the first thing you do with a rocket is that you need fuel. Without fuel, you just have a chunk of of, of material going nowhere. Right. So I was like, I need I need fuel, and the easiest fuel to make is called rocket candy. It's basically sugar. So C12, H11, uh, O22, uh, which is really, uh, it's, it's a material that's extremely dense in energy. And that's why you make creme brulee. And that's why uh. everything that's sweet burns really fast because there's so much energy in sugar that it just, it just combusts. Right, right. And so you can actually tap into the potential of sugar by using an oxidizer. So an oxidizer, in a, in a rocket propellant, you need oxygen and fuel uh, because you need a lot of oxygen and there's not enough in, right. in the atmosphere to, to propel a rocket. So, um, you can use raw sugar as, as a fuel, and then for a, for a, a an oxidizer, you can use potassium nitrate. But potassium nitrate is a controlled substance in Canada, so you can't order it, and you can only get it through research. And that's that's a story I tell every time. You can only get potassium nitrate through um, a research center or for agriculture. And approved, it, okay approved organization and so i went to a, i was 17 and i went to a, a bunch of universities polytechnic concordia i went to my own my own cgip which i won't name and i was like hey i i need I, I i need to access this material because i've got a really good idea i want to try this out and they were all like yeah sure and then a week <laughs> later i get i get an email from the dean or whatever and he says no we're not we're not going to give you that like it's a controlled substance and so i didn't get any access to this and 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 the sad story is, is that um, at the time, I was I was in a little startup with my friend Farouk, um, mm -hmm. called called Micro, and we were we were basically going in schools and doing STEM projects with kids to uh, to to get them to look into the the potential of having a, a career in science. Right. Um, and we wanted to do this this rocket as part of as part of Micro, and our supervisor Abrebeuf was a a. a a professor of Arab origin, and Farouk is from Morocco, uh, and I am myself. My dad is from Tunisia. So you know, um, we here and we apply to get these these materials, these this this potassium mm. nitrate, and we got as a response. Listen, Stihil, Farouk is Arabic. You are Arabic by descendants, and your supervisor is Arabic. How would it sound if three Arabs were working on a rocket project and it exploded? Wait, who, 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 who gave you this response? I, I, I you don't I have don't, to drop I, the name. You don't have to drop the name, but it's just like, what is his position like? It's, it's, it's a, 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 a responsible for labs at a school. Uh, oh, I, I don't want to okay. say more because I have a lot of ties to that school, but yeah. Of course, of course. Um, so, so obviously that frustrated me a lot. You mm -hmm. know, like it's the first yeah. time that my, my father's origin affected me that right. was born and raised in Montreal and I was like and, and that that it, it shouldn't it shouldn't be a problem if, even if I was born and raised in Tunisia or or Morocco or whatever mm -hmm. there shouldn't be a problem and so I got so frustrated that I was like you know what I'm not going to depend on anyone no one wanted to help me no one wanted to finance me no one wanted to supervise me or give me the materials I needed so I went to the country to my mother's country house and I built a makeshift lab in her garage where I would have like a, a ventilation system with a fan and big like uh, dryer conducts and duct tape everywhere to like pull out mm. the, the gases. I had like my, my table set up, I had my light, I had my safety equipment and I synthesized my own potassium nitrate from scratch. I was like, you know what? I'm I'm gonna make it myself. And so you need you need potassium for the potassium nitrate. So I found potassium in potassium chloride, which you can mm. find in salt substitute 
by, by uh, Windsor, I think, the, the salt brand. And then I needed um, ammonium nitrate to find the nitrate. And ammonium nitrate you can find in like um, compresses, like uh, instant compresses when you're cold, or when you have a, when I, when you have a bruise. So I bought mm -hmm. a bunch of those and I purified it and I did like everything I learned in, 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 C in, sorry, in CGIP and in high school and chemistry of how to precipitate yep. things. And all, all those classes, like stoichiometric equations, I actually used them to develop and, and purify my, my, my potassium nitrate. And in the end, I got a 90% purity crystal of potassium nitrate, crystals of potassium nitrate, which I was able, and when it's pure enough, you can actually eat it. It's that safe. And so on camera, I, I have a video where I explain my whole process. I eat my fuel to show that my fuel <laughs> is that, it's that safe. Yeah. And, and my mother, once again, no one wanted to help me, even my mother. So I, and she was scared as hell of my work. Obviously. Uh, my, my kid so, is eating rocket fuel for, <laughs> for school. <laughs> so I would wake up at 2 a.m. when I know that she was asleep and I would go work in the garage. No, sorry. Yeah, 2 a.m. And I would go work in the garage until 9 a.m. when I knew that she was going to wake up and I would go back to bed hiding from her that I was doing this. And then I would wake up at 1 and repeat at 1 p.m. and repeat the process so that I can keep working on my, and I would hide everything and clean everything. And eventually I was, I tested my fuel and I showed her, listen, like I'm, I'm able to do this. And she believed me. She was the first person wow. to, yeah. That is quite the origin story. You went full Breaking Bad for this rocket thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it worked and it paid off. Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, obviously, I don't recommend it. It's obviously really dangerous, and you need to know what you're doing. But mm -hmm. um, it's it's sometimes worth it in life to take take risks. So Absolutely. that that propelled me in my my own life. You know, I I was able to continue this rocket. I designed my my engine. I I wanted to three D print my engine because you know, like met, met, metal is 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 really expensive. You need to know how to machine it, how to weld it. So I wanted to three D print it. But then mm -hmm. obviously, if you three D print it, it burns at it melts at really low temperatures. Um, so you need something to protect the plastic. So I designed my own thermal paste, which can protect the engine and all of that. And, and, and I went through the whole process. It took me a year and a half. Um, and, and in the end, I was able to, to test it in the States. Um, and, and the advantage of taking that risk, and, and just, to, just to give context, in, in a year before that, I was flunking my maths. I wasn't passing my math because I wasn't interested in school at all. Um, right. And then um, I was, I think I racked up 22 detentions in a year. Nice. Uh, I, yeah, I almost got kicked out of, of my school. And oh, it's wow. just because I, I didn't discover my, I didn't know my own potential, my untapped potential. And so right. then I realized the potential of what I was learning in class and how I could apply it to rocketry. And that, that got me interested, you know? Uh, and so I brought this project to the, the Canadian wide science fair, which is the biggest science fair in Canada, which you have to go through the, you have to th go through the local science fair, your city science mm -hmm. fair, your provincial science fair. And then you get to the, the Canada wide science fair. And I got to present my, my project over there. And, and, to, to discuss about it and my project was called um, citizens of space because i wanted to re-democratize aerospace and show how you don't need a million yeah. dollars to test your own ideas you just need a garage and lack of and some creative thinking yeah exactly and and a lot of coffee and so i presented it there and that I went from, from, from flunking my mass to presenting to these conferences and then I got the attention of the Order of Physicists of Canada, which gave me this award for my work, this, this, the Award of Association of Physicists of Canada. Then the Order of Engineers also noticed my work and gave me the, 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 wow. the scholarship of the Orders of Engineers of Quebec. Uh, and then all of that made me build a CV, uh, which allowed me to apply for, for, for the, the Schulich Scholarship, which is this really big scholarship in Canada, which funds your whole education. The biggest scholarship, yeah. I think. Yeah. So I was able to apply to that. And this kid that was flunking his maths in sec four got that scholarship. And now I'm at McGill working and being paid for my passion, for what I like doing. And so it, it, this can be a message to, the, to the, for the students out there that are a bit lost and don't know who they are, what mm. they want. Man, just, or just try something out. Just explore your passions. Go to a science fair. Talk about aquaponics like I, I did in my first science fair. Talk about <laughs> anything you want. Just learn to develop the skills that will allow you to present what you really yeah. discover that you really like in life. And try things out. That's the, if, if I could give one advice or two advices, actually. Two things. Even that better. Are, two things that, that let's, let's make it three, okay? All right. Three things that I would recommend to to anyone, any, you're 35, you're 18, you're 16, explore your passions, try things out. 
go to science fairs or go to uh, mm-hmm. go to do if you're into literature go do like contest competitions if you're into like rhetoric go to rhetoric competitions go do debate whatever just explore your passions try things out you're young you have nothing to lose or you're 35 yeah. even better you have the resources to allow yourself to do these things so try things out then learn to communicate your idea as well. Because the difference between an engineer, a good engineer, and an excellent engineer, or an excellent scientist, or any excellent citizen, is a citizen or a person that's able to express and communicate and transmit his good or her good mm. ideas. Because it's one thing having so good much. ideas, but then learning to communicate them and make other people believe in them is what drives up leadership and makes a team around you, people that support you and a support group that believes in your idea because you were able to convince them that then Mm -hmm. want to help you do your idea, right? So explore your passions, um, learn to communicate and stay human is my third third advice. Because I see a lot of my friends that, that go into like these projects at the science fair that spend all their time on and, and obviously, I'm, I'm not better. I spend a lot of my time on my projects. But mm-hmm. that they, they forget that they're human. You know, you need human experiences on top of, of those projects. Like social and interactions and, social and personal interactions, relationships? Personal family relationships. And, okay. Go on trips. Go, don't, like, it's, it's easy to spend when, when you get in that feedback loop of the science fair where they're like, oh, wow, good work. Here's an award. Yeah. Keep, keep, you keep in the, in the loop. Don't forget to see your friends from time to time. Don't forget to, and I say that and I, and I still don't find the secret to balance work and life, but mm-hmm. stay human. You know, that's, that's the best, the best thing you have is being a human. So when you overdo anything at all, it could become, could have negative drawbacks later on. I totally agree. Absolutely. Yeah. You talked about the, uh, how essential it is to be able to communicate your vision. And before this, we talked about your experiences when you were in high school of joining the debate club um, and how, how that helped you communicating. T- tell me more about that. So um, I started debate when I was 18, I think. Uh, and um, I, I've always been a, an, <laughs> a, a very debating person. Um, my dad would, 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 when I wanted to go out and see my friends, he would always ask me, you know, like, why should you go out? Give me a good reason. And mm. it would force me to think. And, and he was, I had really strict parents when I was growing up. They, they learned that they could eventually um, trust me. And so they, right. they were less strict, but at the start, I had to convince them for everything, right? Like to let me go out, to let me go to sleep later. Yeah. And so I just kept on argumenting with them, which is maybe not the best thing to do when you, when you have strict parents, but it, it, it taught me how to, 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 and structure your arguments structure my thoughts you know and yeah. and i saw the potential of that so i went into debate because i've always loved talking like you might hear from this conversation i and, love it um and and i i quickly fell in love with it you know like mm-hmm. you, you you have this whole range of subjects things that you don't know about you know i i'm not that good in history and and they would ask me to debate on on american independence mm. and and the referendums in quebec and stuff like that that i have no idea about so you right. have to well i do have a basic idea because i've been in school but you have to you know learn how to um and analyze what someone is saying and and counteract in the mechanisms and the logic of what they're saying and all of that structures your mind and so it allowed me to really make like what my the good ideas I had, I was able to learn how to enunciate them, and and quickly I became captain of this this debate team mm. because I had this drive to to allow people to see in it what I what I saw in in, yeah. in the potential of it, and um, I, I made a really good friend in it, Thomas Roussel, and the best the best colleagues in debate, so the best you're always in a team of two, um, so yeah. my, my best teammate. Thomas Roussel is someone that's completely opposite of me. He is interested in complete opposite subjects and, and, and has a different perspective on, on almost everything. But what made us so good as a team was that we, um, we, we had a passion for understanding the mechanisms of things. Like I would, I would have no idea about the political um, or legislation aspect mm-hmm. he was mentioning. But I would ask, like, okay, so how does it operate? How did they put it in place? Can we argument on that? And and it worked flawlessly. And and we actually were the first CJET team to win a, a university debate competition. Wow. Um, so knowing how to ask the right questions. Knowing how to ask the right questions. And and you know, 
that helps me in, incredibly in, in my life, in my professional life today, writing emails. I know how to convince people. Oh, sure, my yeah. Just ideas and stuff like that. So I don't do debate anymore, sadly, because I don't have the time. And I would love to have the time. I was actually on the, on the phone with the, the, like, an hour ago with the, the captain of the McGill team of debate that was asking me if I could do it this year. Because I oh, met wow. the debate competitions. And I, I, I can't. I don't have the time. I have to prioritize. But you, you definitely, like, if, it's, it's one of the best decisions I've made in my life. Science fairs and, and debate taught mm. me a lot. Yeah. Interesting thing is tomorrow at 1245, I have an interview to join the debate club. Any advice for me or for uh, anybody else uh, who's listening? Uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so I know, I probably know the, yeah, I know the captain that's interviewing you. Um, oh, wow. Did you prepare? <laughs> uh, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, the question is, uh, you're the mayor of Montreal. Yeah. What are, are you for or against defunding the SPVM? Oh, that's an excellent question. So the SPVM is the, uh, the police uh, yep. in Montreal. Um, oh, wow, that's excellent. Um, that's a good one. <laughs> I remember because I was, I was in the jury panel, right? <laughs> so, um, okay, don't, don't be too prepared because debate is all about you Think know, quick if, on your feet and quick on improvising. Your so yeah. you don't want to have too much to rely on because then if they ask questions, you always go back to your preparation. So you want to be quick sure. on your feet. Um, and then think about, think about the, so it's, it's easy to lose someone. You know, when, when you talk out loud, things sound well in your head, you're structured in your head, but mm -hmm. since you're thinking on the spot, sometimes it's not as structured when it comes out. Yeah. So the best thing to prevent losing your audience is having a storyline or in French, a line directrice. That means like a, 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 a line or an, an arrow in your head that connects yeah. all your arguments to a bigger statement. Imagine that your, your statement is saying like, well, I mean, I'm thinking this right now, I have nothing prepared, right? Um, why would, should we defund the SPVM? Um, and your statement through all your arguments, you want to follow one, one main line would be, it provides better protection for the citizen. I have an and angle. Then, have an angle, exactly. And, and then when you lose yourself, when you lose yourself in your arguments, you can always come back to that angle. And you can always relate your arguments to that angle. So mm. it's, it's, it's way easier to, 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 to have that. And that's always what I, I try to say the first time when I was coaching debate. Uh, I, I coached debate at PSNM as well, this, this, this all uh, school mm. girl. Wow. Oh, sorry, all girls school. And that's always what I start with is that your arguments are like vectors, right? So they go up, down, oh, left, right, etc. But at the end, you get to, you know, you get to... Uh, a first and final position, even if your, your arguments and your vectors go all over the place. And at the end, if you add all those vectors, it gives you a resultant vector. And that vector is your line, how you connect the start to the end. And that has to be clear. You have to always say, so this is my argument and that's how it connects to the end. This is my argument and how it connects to the end. And to give you an example with SPVM, why does it protect better the citizen? Because let's say that if you defund the police, you have more money for social services like um like um drug drug abuse uh, so then like policemen or policewomen or, yeah. or officers that are not trained in 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 working with overdose cases or um drug abuse where, where people are violent because they're under drugs you know what's worse than someone that's in a trip that's in a psychosis and, right. and you oh. come and you grab them and you're violent with them i love it this technique you, yeah, it gives you more. Uh, it gives you more funding for those opportunities, and then it also uh, makes police more. You know, um, when when you defund police, you have more money so for social services, and then the the police can then focus on the actual police work because police mm -hmm. aren't necessarily doing things bad. They're just putting. They're just put in situations they're not trained for, like mental illness. If we take that money and we put it into like psychiatric urgent help, police can actually do the job they're supposed to do. They're not overloaded with drug cases and not overloaded with psychiatric help. They can actually do like, like protect people from robberies, from, from, from all yeah. of those things. So my two arguments here, my first argument was you have more money for social services. And my second uh, argument was like, police can actually focus on the work they have to do. And the line that goes through it is it protects better the citizen. Because if I go on a drug overdose, I, I won't, but let's say that I do. I'm better protected because I won't be mishandled yeah. by police if I'm doing a psychosis because I'm having a panic attack or whatever. I know that I'll have trained people that have a certification in psychosis to handle me in the way they have to. So it's better for the citizen. And then 
my house is better protected or whatever I have is better protected because police Man. can actually do their own, their job. So it all ties to the same line. So that's why debate is so important. It teaches you how to structure your thoughts on your feet. What's so great is that I just recorded all of that. I'm sure I think you're going to copy word by word what you said. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was it's amazing what you just did on the spot like that without any you know i told you the topic 30 seconds ago and then you were just able to take one thought and then just keep going and keep going and then tying it back to the main thought it's an art that is, and it has to be trained like every kind of mm -hmm. art you know i miss it i do i do sincerely miss it and i wish i could go back here i had a i had a plan with thomas my partner to go mm -hmm. to the international debate competition which is expected to be in quebec uh if, oh, if wow and we were planning it. last year was in Morocco and we were looking at it and we were staring at it and we actually have a lot of potential and we were thinking of getting a private trainer and all of that but obviously time is a constant mm -hmm. that keeps on decreasing so that is it's actually going to be in Quebec uh, well okay so you have the the national debate competitions in French and in English and uh, the French one the French version of it is expected to, to come in, to come to Quebec yeah Oh, nice. Good for yeah. good for us. We're getting so many things so yeah. fast. Yeah. So you know we gotta we gotta keep up, and uh, it's it's an opportunity that won't come again. You know, yeah. Quebec is is pretty far from the rest of the francophone world. So that is true. Now, um, one thing I want to ask you: when you look back and the last couple of years of things that you've been working on, um, what are some of your biggest failures or mistakes that you've made these times that you? That, you know, that changed the course or something that you wouldn't want to do again? That's a very good question. <sighs> mistakes that I've done. I'll, I'll talk about the mistakes, but I'll also talk about some regrets that I have. But okay. um, mistakes, um, I think for a long while, I valued the opinion of others too much. Mm. It was, you know, I was really deep into debate and debate is all about, you know, charisma and, and convincing people. And so you need a good ethos and you have logos, pathos and ethos. Logos is logic. Pathos is like emotion and, and, and ethos is mm -hmm. who you are. Like who's talking? Is it Barack Obama or is it your, your, your common whatever um and and i was working on my ethos i wanted to be you know like a reference and i wanted to and i thought too much about what people were thinking of me and that par paralyzed me in many ways and i stopped progressing i sort of idled because um you know a lot of a lot of people are scared of differences and and yeah. at some point i was doing all these things people saw me as different people saw me as you know sort of a threat to to their competitive edge or whatever and and I stopped doing things for a while or, or slowed down because I felt like my friends were supportive or, or stuff like that. And, and at some point you just learn to detach yourself from that. Mm. Um, and I think a mistake that I did is be stuck in that mindset too long. And that's what kept me in, in kept me in trouble and all of that because I didn't want to be the, the nerd that I am. Like, you know, right. at some point you've got to assume who you are. Um, mm. So yeah, there, there's definitely that um, as a mistake. Um, and, and, and if I go about with regrets, um, I regret, I don't regret many things because what I, when I do it, it's because I believe in it a hundred percent, but uh, mm -hmm. there are some things you will regret no matter what you do. Right. And obviously when, when you go into all these things, like, like right now I'm doing a, a full course load as a student. I'm working like 20 hours a week, 30 hours a week on the rocket team. I'm working 15 hours a week on my, on my startup. Um, then I'm also involved in all these, these, these STEM uh, sensibilization or like exposure things where we go into schools and we talk. Uh, I do my motorcycle license at the same time, you know, like, I, like I'm doing a lot of things at the same time. And, and when you do all these things, when I used to do the debate, I didn't have that much time to see my friends in the end, which is important. I, yeah. I, I could see them like once every two weeks or stuff like that. And, and some of my friends started to resent me for that. Uh, and you know, that's, that's hard. Like where, where you you see the people that you surround yourself to support you, to support you that start like being mad at you for not being there. Right. And, and you lose some people along the way. And that's, that's pretty difficult, you know, to see some friends mm -hmm. distance themselves from you. And it's like, listen, it's my passion and I've got to do it. And that's another thing where I had to learn to listen for some friends come and go and you have to take care of your friends. 
but they have to understand also where you're coming from. And whenever I can, I see my friends, but it was, it, it was definitely hard to see some of my friends, like even in the first years of university, being mad at me for, for not being available. And you surround, you end up surrounding yourself by people that understand because those that don't just leave. And, and right. that, that's painful, you know, but it's, it's important to surround yourself by a social network that understands who you are. And that don't necessarily do the same thing as you do. They, they're maybe not as involved, but understand that you're just different. And, and that's really important. So I went from having a bunch of people that I knew and that I was, that I was friends with to a few key people that I want to keep in my life and that mm. I value a lot. Um, and that understand that understand me. So I'd say that one of my regret, it, one of my regrets is um, is seeing these people go that that was close to. Um, but there's nothing I could do because I'm telling you, my my dream, my dream, my end goal is is what pushes me to wake up at six a.m. Is what pushes mm, your calling, work. like my calling. And I I am ready to sacrifice anything for that dream. So Jesus, yeah, yeah, that's what it takes. So in a way, it, well, it's your social circle got very lean, lean down because yeah. you were, well, you were making decisions on whether, you know, you want to focus on the thing you want to do for may probably maybe the rest of your life. Definitely. Versus, mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, um, I, I used to play rugby in CJ and I made a lot of friends through rugby and I could go to, I couldn't go to any social event in rugby. Like I couldn't, <laughs> I didn't have the time. So like my friends were like, where are you? You know, like we're a team. You're supposed to be there. And yeah. I'm like, Listen, I'm I'm in on Parliament Hill this weekend because I'm, I'm debating, or whatever. <laughs> and and they're like, okay, cool, but we don't matter to you. And I'm like, it's not that. It's just I I got I got to mm. do it, you know. So it's something that you have to learn. Um, that and organization skills are the two things that. Yeah, about learn. about that, you're doing. You just said like like seven I don't know seventy hours work week or something like that. How do you stay organized? How do you be efficient with all these things that you're doing? My, my agenda is my wife. Like she, she, she's, she's, I call, I call her a she because she keeps me on track. Is she and a paperback? She's a paperback. She's a molestian. Uh, oh. She's always by my side. Like whenever I'm doing anything, I'm, I'm showing you at the camera right now for mm -hmm. those that are listening. It's a black, it's, mo it's moleskin or moleskin? Moleskin. It's a, moleskin. It's a brand um, mm -hmm. that has really good quality paper and I destroy my pages and I even oh, go wow. to rip it. So you see like I put everything inside. Yeah. I have I have a date. I'm seeing my dad. I have to bring my cat to the veterinarian. I have an mm. exam. Everything is in my agenda, and and that's how you really see like which weeks are best to put what. Like I just got contacted uh, for my start of vital. Um, for we we have a funding opportunity. We have a uh, a, a a a pension. Uh, sorry, a, a student led fund that wants to invest in it for in our technology to allow us mm -hmm. to grow. And I I he was the. Gab, who's who's leading this, was DM me on LinkedIn. It was like, hey, we really want to have you. We want to have you on a call to see how much we can, you know, like how we can participate in your endeavor. And I'm like, that's great. It's funding opportunity for my startup. But then I look at my agenda, and there's literally not one hour Man. when I'm free. And it's like, like, like tonight, like after after this call, I've I got to clean my apartment, right? I haven't cleaned it in the week because I I've, I've been having school, and so. I'm going to start cleaning my apartment at 8 30. You're probably going to finish at 10 30 and waking up at 6 a.m. again. So it's like, and I had to schedule it to next week. So they're literally saying, like, listen, we want to maybe invest in you. And I'm like, it's got to be next week. I'm sorry. Jeez. <laughs> you're telling your own investor, hey, sorry, man, you got to wait. <laughs> well, if they believe in us enough right, to wait, they in they're, they're, they're worth it, you know? So, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and I feel bad. I'm sorry if, if anyone of, of FRV is listening to this, which is the fund. Um, we will make it worth your time. Patience a is a virtue of life. You know, yeah. sometimes you have to be patient. Where, <laughs> and uh, where, do you, where do you see yourself in 10, 20 years? So for those that don't see, uh, on, my, on the left of, of my office, uh, which is my old room, which I converted into an office, I have a huge whiteboard. And this whiteboard is like half my wall. And this whiteboard is where I want to go in life. And obviously, it's, it's a whiteboard, so you can erase it and redraw mm -hmm. things. And there's like six colors on it. And, and there's lines everywhere. And only I can understand what's, what's the logic in here. <laughs> and since I was maybe six, five, six years old, I knew that one day, or at least I will try to do everything I can to be an astronaut. Literally, everything I can. I will give my 100%. And that is often a childish dream. And when people ask me, what do you want to do in life? I hesitate to say it because everyone wanted, like almost every right. little it's boy wanted to be cheesy option, yeah. naive. 
but you know i kept it down low and, and i'm doing everything in my capacity to work towards that i've mm -hmm. been actively involved in the in the reserve in in, in all those things and and I'm investing in all my time in aerospace and um, i'm applying to these these positions in in, in as amateur not amateur sorry as civil astronauts where you do research as an astronaut in really high atmospheres um, to study like high altitude clouds. I'm doing my, I'm, I've, I've just registered for my plane license. Um, yeah. I'm doing all these things because eventually that's my final goal. Mm -hmm. and, and on this board, you have my plan from A to Z where I have all my idols at the top and, and, and many astronauts too. And what did they do? I stalked them on LinkedIn. I read their biographies many times. And what did, what yeah. did they do? They did a PhD. I, I'm looking at it right now. Okay, so I have <laughs> me mechanical engineering at McGill. Under, I have internship VS research, which is best. And then I have an arrow that links both and says CSA, the Canadian Space Agency, is research, but also an internship. So I can apply that to an industry job as well. Um, and then I got research in the aerospace field. Then I have um, research at McGill for the first summer, um, then you go into the industry to be more relevant to the technology. I have that written right there. Then and I have an arrow after mechanical engineering at McGill. I have master's in engineering in the States or in Europe because I have a Belgian passport since my mom is, is from Belgium. And then under that, I have an arrow that says PhD in, 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 the, in the States. And I have like Cambridge. I have also Oxford. And I have all the price tags and of, of oh, how wow. much it would cost. And I added them. And then I have another arrow that brings to $2 signs. And it's basically, okay, so you want to do these things. You want to allow yourself to do these high level of studies to be able to be an astronaut someday. So that's going to cost a lot, especially if you go to the States. How are you going to pay for it? How are you going to graduate without debt? So I have a whole financial plan as well that's going to allow me to do these things. And, and, and if that works out, I'm going to graduate without debt. And, and I am going to do anything in my, my possibility so that that plan works out. And I have David Saint-Jacques on there. I have um, either, even um, the, the latest uh, Canadian astronaut, uh, Jennifer Sidney Gibbons, um, worked, uh, was studied at McGill in mechanical mm. engineering. Uh, and, and I'm following her, her footsteps closely. I'm trying to see what wow. I can do uh, similar to her. So I've got, and, and, and I've got this statement at the bottom where it's like, you know, it's a lot of risk all these things like your PhD is five years of work, four years of work. It might not be as relevant as it was before, mm -hmm. but it is worth it in the context of, of, of be, wanting to be an astronaut. And so I have written under it, better be 70 and knowing you've done everything you could or be 70 and then, or be 70 and be full of regrets. So I prefer to be 70 years old and having lost some time of my life doing a PhD that mm -hmm. eventually didn't lead me to being an astronaut, but you know, I've, I would have tried everything. And I, like that, I know that if I don't get it, it's because of something that I could not control. And right, and you would be at peace yeah. with that. I would be at peace with that. And, and I say right by it, this, if, if it doesn't work, you will have lived a life full of nice experiences, of incredible experiences, because you've pushed yourself out of your comfort zone. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I on it, I have like, I want to run a marathon. I wanted to run a marathon this year, but it got canceled because of COVID. I want to do my scuba license. So I, I do a lot of public speaking to learn about how, you know, to, like I'm doing right now, to, to, to be able to be that, that, that person eventually. So, you know, when you have a dream like that, a dream that scares you, my, my, this dream scares me. You know it's the right dream. Because right. fear is the best engine. It pushes you to do things. It scares you, but you're still so attracted to it at the same I'm time. So That's how you know. It. Definitely. So I'll keep on pushing. And I can tell you that if you ask me in, in, mm -hmm. in 10 years, what do you want to be in 10 years? And I still haven't achieved it. I will give you the same answer. Because in, in, in maybe 15 years of conscious life, I have not changed my objective. Mm. Still where I want to be. Now, if I'm still doing this podcast in 15 years, I'm going to test you on that. <laughs> Perfect. See you then. All right. Listen, <laughs> the time is uh, coming to an end. It, 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 I, I had the time of my life. It, you're so inspiring. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. So interesting. Uh, you're welcome back anytime. But uh, we're well, just going to end it for today. We have, I bet you still have a lot to talk about. So. <laughs> Always. I love to talk, like you said. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your time. And please don't hesitate if you have uh, any questions. And for people that are listening, if they want to contact me, uh, I am on LinkedIn. So Cyril Mani. Uh, I think my, my contact, my name will be in the description of this. Mm -hmm. So please don't hesitate if you have questions or you want to see what I'm up to. All, All right. right. Take care, everyone. Thank you.
A big thank you to everyone who reached the end. I appreciate every bit of support from you. You can follow us on Instagram and on YouTube at The Visionaires. You can email us at thevisionairespodcast at gmail.com if you want to tell us anything at all. If you enjoyed the episode, please tell your friends about us so we can have more exciting guests in the future. And if you have a certain person in mind that you want to have on the program, hit us up. All right? All right. Goodbye. Goodbye.